Hello, uh, welcome to the second day of, of the uh, training taster sessions that we're doing here at BVE. These are little 45 minute uh, tasters for Route 6's uh, half day and one day uh, training sessions. Today's session, uh, uh, a video and audio test and measurement primer, is meant to be representative of um, sort of three uh, sort of half and one day courses we do at Route 6, uh, video 101, audio 101 and, and QC 101. So very much aimed at um, trainee engineers, operators who are starting to step up in QC programs, or you know, even runners who are moving up into the machine room and, and needing to get to grips with some of the principles of video. Um, my name is Phil Crawley. I, I run the systems integration department at Route 6. So uh, we're, 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 you know, our job is, is building television facilities, both large and small. Um, and I also have the privilege of, of running Route 6's training program. Um, today, uh, my intention is to sort of uh, just kind of recap some of those audio and video measurement principles why, why they're important and, and, um, and what typically you'd be looking for as, a, as an engineer looking after a video delivery process. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, about legalizers and, and how they fit into the whole television delivery chain and, uh, and how that can make things easier uh, for a QC process. Um, a big thing issue at the moment is, is restricted color spaces in HD delivery. So if you're delivering to a certain very large broadcaster who, uh, who live out in Osterley, uh, that's something that's uh, significant. And then we'll move on to some issues surrounding audio, um, uh, the, the kind of things you'd expect to see if you're QCing audio for, for delivery. Um, and then some of the more advanced problems like uh, photosensitive epilepsy and caption sizes and all the other things that might get your commercial or your program thrown back at you with all the expense that that entails. Um, we'll touch on Dolby E, uh, you know, multi-channel delivery with, with HD video is upon us. And, uh, and then we'll maybe talk a little bit about, about bitrate reduction and codecs and how that impacts on the television production and delivery chain. Um, as it says there, this is just really an introduction. It's a taster of, of what you'd, you'd, you'd come across if you were to come to Route 6 and, and do one of our courses. So a little recap of, of, of video and audio measurement principles. Having, having a, a, an often overzealous broadcaster throw a tape back at you at your facility um, can be quite expensive, as well as the damage that it does to your repu reputation. And um, broadcasters in recent years have become very much uh, stronger, very much more critical about delivery specifications. Um, uh, years ago, the BBC would have been very, very sort of understanding and, and you know so long as they could sort of see the tape before transmission you know pretty much anything went but nowadays because most material is QC'd in an automated fashion um, attention to video audio and, and content issues is very important from the get-go with video of course you're looking for uh, you know does the video is it constrained to, 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 to the levels between black and white you know it doesn't stretch outside those limits um, is that is the color content constrained within the, the gamut of the system you're dealing with. You don't want to produce illegal colors that will cause problems further downstream. And then with audio, uh, the soundtrack, uh, yeah, is it constrained to within you know, the eight DBUs that were allowed, you know, six on the PPM, all those kind of things, and does it have a sensible dynamic range? And then there's the, the content of the pictures. Uh, captions, are, are they the right height? Captions aren't allowed to go below a certain height because if the caption reads, your house may be at risk if you do not keep up the payments on this loan, um, that's legally significant. Um, action and graphics safe, you know, uh, captions constrained within a part of the picture where they can be read. Photosensitive epilepsy. Um, uh, the, the, the worst thing a broadcaster feels is, fears is, is transmitting material that will cause health and safety issues. Uh, and then time code, uh, that's, that's very important, that uh, the, the label on the front of the tape or, or the, the metadata that goes along with the deliverable file reflects the time code of, of the program as it exists. And then there's clock and identification and, and consistent aspect ratio. Does the program conform to whatever the delivery spec is in terms of, you know, is it 60 by 9 or 4 by 3? Becoming less of an issue now, particularly with HD, because there is no 4 by 3 HD, but still important. If you've, if you've done any work uh, in a television machine room or an edit suite or, or an OB truck, you will no doubt have seen that kind of display on a, on a waveform monitor. 
And uh, the, uh, the, the left-hand tile there, the left-hand sort of black with, with a white trace on it, that's, that's what you know, engineers refer to as a, as a waveform. And that's the waveform that's, that's represented by the, the color bar picture on the right-hand side there. And in fact, you can see that on, on, on the left-hand tile, we've got our three traces. The first one is, is the luminance or, or the overall black and white um, uh, content of the picture. And then we've got our two color difference signals. We won't dwell on that too much, but that's, that's typically the waveform that engineers are looking at when they're, when, when they're checking back levels of video. Um, the, the, the luminous signal is meant to be constrained so that the black parts of the signal are at the very bottom, that heavy white line you can see there, and, and the very bright parts of the picture, the whites, are at the very top there. And uh, it's marked 0.7 on, on the scale, uh, which refers back to the old analog video of, of 0.7 of a volt. And, and, and that's, that's kind of the limits of, of, of video. The two color difference signals, the, the ones that come after it, which represent the blue and the red color differences with in the picture. Again, they're constrained to the same range of values. Um, and, and you can see that they're, they're noticeably different to the luminance signal because they, they, they represent something different. Now, wouldn't it be good if there was a machine that could, that could get these jolly old video signals correct for us? And in fact, there is. Uh, it's called a legalizer. And uh, a lot of people uh, sell those and use them in their edit suites. And a lot of uh, this whole kind of QC process of delivering correct video for transmission is governed by, by, by a, a legalizer. It's the box that makes sure your pictures are street legal. Legalizers have, have something of a checkered history. Um, 15 years ago, when, when, they were, when they were very new and shiny and, and not many people had them, uh, they were quite brutal instruments. They would, uh, you know, if, if, if a mere sniff of, of incorrect video was passed through a legalizer of the time, it would, it, would make the le it would make the video correct, but it would leave the pictures, you know, something the worse for it. Modern legalizers have come on a long way, and, and, and the three traces you can see here are, again, they're that luminance signal, that black and white detail of, of, of the video signal. And what I've done is I've, I've taken a signal which has intentionally been made illegal. If you, if you peer hard, you can see that, that, that the top and the bottom of that video trace go below zero volts at the left-hand side, and they go above 0.7 of a volt at the right-hand side. And in fact, there's also a little squiggly bit of detail to, to, to show you know, how the signal is, is affected. So the, the middle tile um, has been passed through a, a legalizer set in the manner of something you would have found in the mid-90s. And all it does is it's quite brutal. It just slices off the top of the signal, and it slices off the bottom of the signal, and produces video that is entirely legal. No, no QC operator at a broadcaster is going to complain about that. But you've lost all the detail in the whites and all the detail in the blacks, and, and your pictures have been left the worst for it. Um, Editors used to hate the idea that their programmers were subsequently going to be passed through a legalizer because it was going to change the way the pictures looked. But the third tile, the right handmost tile there, is, is an example of a, of a modern legalizer, a contemporary legalizer, which does a very clever thing. As, as the video starts to approach illegality at the top end, it starts applying a very gentle roll off to the signal and, and brings it right into legality so that you've even still got the detail at the top end. So, so if you imagine real pictures, that might be the clouds, or it might be the, the detail in somebody's forehead, you know, where, where the light's very intense. But you haven't just sliced off all that detail. You've maintained the detail by applying a gentle attenuation to the whole top end of the signal. And similarly, at the bottom end as well, the legalizer's applied a very gentle lift to the signal over the first 10 or 20% of the range. So you've got a picture that doesn't look exactly like what went in, but it's still pleasing. You haven't lost any of the detail in the blacks or in the whites, but you've, you've, you, you've still achieved that legality, um, which is, is what you're looking for. And in fact, these splendid machines, legalizers, which you often find in edit suites nowadays, um, there's an audio equivalent as well, and that's called a compressor. And quite a lot of audio um, uh, finishing facilities will have a compressor to restrain the audio levels to within legal limits so that you don't run the risk of uh, 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 the QC operator at a broadcaster um, throwing the, uh, the tape back at you and complaining that you've, uh, you've violated levels and all those things. So this is, this is the, the display of a, of a contemporary uh, television test set. This is a, 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 a Tektronix uh, WVR or WFM model machine. Um, uh, Route 6 are a Tektronix reseller, so we tend to re reference everything back to Tektronix. Um, they really are... 
uh, the, the, the premium product, uh, people only buy other manufacturers because they can't afford Tektronix. So I'm sure some of them here would disagree with that. But uh, it's the case that uh, if you want, if you want, you know, the, the, the last word in, in, in television test sets, uh, Tektronix WVR WFM series uh, will suit you. And whether it's high definition or standard definition, what range of features there's there's a model to suit your budget, sort of thing. So what you can see here is the output of a uh, of a WVR series. Um, scope, as, as engineers refer to them, and uh, it presents us with a, a four-tile display, and the, the, the top left tile there is that same um, component video waveform that we saw earlier, showing us the, the luminance levels and the, and the two color difference signals. Then we've got uh, next to that something called a lightning display, which is just another way of visualizing the values of the color information within the signal. Color, color information is very important because it's, it's the thing that, that gets um, knocked out of kilter by, by grading systems and by all the other uh, processes that are applied in, in modern television production. Um, you know, it's often said that, that uh, you know, when you, when you watch like modern drama or whatever, that the pictures look nothing like they did when they came out of the camera. And that's true. You know, news, news footage looks different from drama productions, looks different from sports. And a lot of that's down to the post-production processes that are applied to the signals in the edit suite, in the grading room, etc. Um, but the, the, the point about that is, is that uh, the, color di the, the color information, the chrominance, um, is can be most easily made illegal by those post-production processes. And then at the, the, the bottom, bottom left there, um, the actor Nicolas Cage, if I'm not mistaken, um, is, um, is, the, is the picture, and that's got a bunch of other information surrounding it. Um, and then we've got an audio display, which in the case of this machine is a bunch of bar graphs and, and a phase display. When we, when we do um, our, our QC training at Route 6, of course, we have a lot longer than 45 minutes, and, and we have examples of these machines for students to play with and, and, and see exactly what they do. And it's a lot easier to visualize how pictures relate to the waveforms and the other measurements that you can make off them if you have a chance to play with the machine. Um, Tektronics are here uh, over... Um, uh, just by Route 6's stand, and um, I would, you know, if you if you have an interest in, in in the technical aspects of television monitoring, I'd encourage you to go and, uh, and 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 have a look at the range they're showing. One of the things that's become uh, a problem for for broadcasters and facilities in our, in these HD times that we live in, is is the idea that. You know, some people will be watching your programs in HD on their brand new HD television sets, but an awful lot of people may still be watching a standard definition service. Um, uh, it's, only, it's only in the last few months that Freeview has got high definition, and still an awful lot of people are running standard definition skyboxes, standard definition virgin boxes. So paying attention to both the high definition path and the standard definition path for high definition material is very important. And <coughs> One leading broadcaster um, in this country and a couple in the States have decided that the best way to do that is to tell um, the people who provide their material that actually they'd like all the, the color information in an HD program constrained to the smaller standard definition color space. That's referred to as the gamut. The gamut is the, is the, is the range of colors that can be displayed within a given system. So, the, the display you can see there, which again is, 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 is available on the Tektronix test sets, uh, but nobody else's, it's a peculiar to, te to Tektronix signal, is, is called an arrowhead display. And, and again, it's just another way of, of representing uh, that, that luminance, that black and white signal, with the two color difference signals overlaid on top of it. So if you, if you look sort of at the bottom left of that trace, um, where it says 0%, which you probably can't see unless you're sitting really near the front, um, that's, that represents the lowest luminance level. And then the luminance levels are run up along the, the vertical axis, going up to 100%, or you know, it, if you relate it back to the other trace we saw, 0.7 of a volt, going up the vertical. And then going along those two diagonals, you've got the two color difference signals. And by clever mathematical mapping, uh, you can display the whole of the video signal, both its color and luminance information, on a single display. And in fact, what this diagram rather splendidly does is it's colored the trace that you would see with the colors of the color bars as they'd appear on a picture. So you can see that if, if we're looking at this, this trace here, starting up there, that's where the yellow bar would be through the cyan, the green, the magenta, the red, through the blue down to the black color bar there. And so it's a very convenient uh, 
um, display upon which to show pictures because you can see if things have become illegal in the in in the luminance direction but you can also see if they've become illegal in the two in the two uh, color difference signals the two chrominance channels now marked on here is uh, several graticules we've got a, a graticule at the top here which shows our limit of luminance legality and then we've got a couple of ranges that show the limit of chrominance legality now if you've produced uh, a, 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 a program in HD and you want to use the glorious full range of, of the, the REC 709 color space, then your color bars can go to the outermost graticule. But if you're delivering to a certain big broadcaster, um, you're obliged to constrain your color space to the innermost graticule. And that means that when they play it out from their systems, they can be certain that the down-converted output of their transmission server will be exactly right in standard definition, as well as the main output going to the high definition signal chain will be in high definition. Um, this all came to a head a couple of years ago when Vodafone was sponsoring a large sporting event. And uh, all the people who were watching um, uh, the, the feed in standard definition, when the brake bumper came and the Vodafone logo came up, noticed that rather than the nice vivid red of the, the Vodafone logo, it was actually a more kind of putrid orange. And, uh, and of course, who's Vodafone's biggest competitor in this country? Um, uh, they wound up not paying for the sponsorship of the event, and, uh, and so consequently a lot of money was lost. So that's the, the, the reason for that. So that's video. Um, and, and you can go into that in a, a huge amount of depth, uh, which um, unfortunately we don't have time for today. Uh, but moving on to uh, the audio side of, of television QC and, and, and presenting um, uh, you know, correct uh, finished audio in a program, here we've got a little screen capture from, from a, a digital audio editing package. And uh, if you're at all familiar with digital audio, um, you'll be aware that running along the horizontal we have time, so that's about a second and a half, just, just at the resolution I, I grabbed it from the screen of, of, of the uh, workstation. And, and going up and down along the vertical, we've got the amplitude of the, of the sound. And, and normally when you see these things, uh, you're seeing uh, test tones, you know, so just a very nice sine wave, which represents uh, the kind of test tone that you hear, you hear at the head of a tape. So if you've, again, if you've ever had to line up a VTR for, for playing into an edit suite or whatever, you'll be aware that typically at the head of a video tape, um, you record a couple of minutes of color bars for the video test and an audio tone at a, at a well-defined level um, uh, at one kilohertz uh, sound you know and you get that pure tone but this is this isn't a test tone this is this is some real audio and I think this is a, a recording of a man's voice saying it starts with and you can kind of see where the words segregate from each other and, and the richness of all the different frequencies and all the different levels within a, a real audio uh, recording um, just really make the, taking it back to a very uh, sort of fundamental level. The frequency of a sound is is the rate at which those peaks occur. How many how many peaks and troughs there are on the audio signal um, in a given amount of time. That's often expressed in in hertz or kilohertz numbers of cycles per second. And, and how loud the sound is perceived is, is, is governed by the intensity of the signal, how, how tall those peaks are. So they're the two aspects of an audio signal that, that you really have to kind of grasp if you're going to start going deeper into how do I make measurements uh, with, with audio? How, how do I understand uh, you know, how what I'm hearing relates to what I'm seeing on a screen or what I'm seeing on a meter? Um, typically, uh, people can hear from about 20 hertz, so 20 cycles per second of, of, of sound, all the way up to about 20 kilohertz, 20,000 cycles. Uh, well, that's the case if you're, if you, if you're, if you're a young adult. Um, I test myself periodically and I'm, and I'm kind of uh, rolling off at about 15 kilohertz now. And within the next few years, I'm sure AM radio will sound like hi-fi to me. And it seems like a, a particularly ironic uh, state of affairs that by the time you can afford really good hi-fi, you can't actually appreciate it. So uh, that's, um, that's, that's audio. Now this next slide, just because the density of text, I, I encourage you not to read it um, and, unless you're, you've downloaded these notes subsequently. Um, but just a few, a few things worth pointing out. Um, all things that store sound, uh, be they a videotape, a CD, a, a DAT record or an MP3 file on your computer, they have a limited range of levels that they can encompass. Um, 
And the difference between the very quietest audio sound that could be captured in a recording machine and the very loudest before the machine distorts is referred to as the dynamic range. And, and, and you know, sensible uh, place to put program audio is somewhere in the middle of that, that dynamic range so that the, the machine is, is reproducing the audio faithfully, it's not distorting because it's too loud, and it's not too noisy because it's too low. And that's, that's most of what drives uh, what we do in terms of audio QC, getting, getting audio ready for broadcast. Um, broadcasters are very hot on audio level and they expect the lineup level at the head of the tape to relate to the material that's on the tape. It's no good if your lineup tone is fantastic but your program is all over the place. The broadcaster will throw that back very quickly. Now, in the case of digital systems, um, like you know, uh, modern video recorders, videotape recorders, uh, CD, DAT, MP3s, when when you try and record a sound that's too loud for the system to be able to encompass it, um, it distorts very noticeably and very, very nastily. And, 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 and a digital system that's uh, distorting is, is awful to hear. And that's, that's you know, contrary to how analog machines behave. If you, if you try and overload an analog tape recorder, um, it degrades gracefully. Um, when you hit the, the limit of, of what the machine can record, it distorts a tiny bit, and then a tiny bit more, and then a tiny bit more, and you have to really push it before it sounds awful. But digital systems, when they hit their digital maximum recording level, they, they, they fall over and sound awful. Um, a common term uh, that you often hear relating to audio measurement is the, the, the dB, the decibel. It's a mathematical expression of difference. Um, kind of akin to a fraction or a percentage, if you will. Um, and if, if you ever hear it applied to an absolute level, it has to be qualified um, by relationship to something else. So you might hear an engineer say that we need to record lineup tone at zero dBUs. Or you might hear the guy in the audio suite say, I never drive my speakers harder than 96 dBAs. Um, but a dB in and of itself is, is just a fraction or a percentage or a ratio. It's not, it doesn't express anything real. Um, there's some easy to remember ratios. If, if somebody says to you that's, that that's six dBs louder than it should be, it means that it's twice as loud. If it's six dBs quieter, it means it's half as loud. And 20 dBs is the same, but with 10 times or a tenth. Now, the slide here, we can see three meters that you'll very commonly come across in, in a television machine room. Um, the first one is, is, the, is the PPM, the venerable PPM that's been in use since, since before the Second World War. Uh, the middle one is the VU meter, very much similar kind of device, but much more of an American thing. And then the third one is the kind of thing you see on the front of your DigiBeta machine. It's a digital meter and expresses audio level in, in, in digital level rather than in an analog level. So you often hear people talking about zero level uh, for lineup. And, and what does that mean? Well, when, when we lived in an analog world, when, when we were recording on one inch or beta SP and, and it was being played down an analog line to Crystal Palace, which is an analog transmitter, um, zero level uh, was a shorthand for saying 0.773 of a volt RMS into a 600 ohm load. Now, it's not something you should ever remember, but, but it, was, it was a defined standard. And, and it was important to know. And, and to make things simpler, um, on, a, on a BBC PPM, th that zero level is expressed as four on the PPM. Um, on an, an American VU meter, it's minus four. And then in our modern times now, where everything's on a digital meter, um, it's, it's, it's neg 18 on a digital meter. By common consent, the, 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 the equivalence of analog levels to digital levels is that zero level, or four on the PPM, equates to neg 18 dBs on the digital meter, so 18 dBs quieter than the loudest sound that the digital VTR can record. And in fact, again, you won't be able to see it, but, but, but down there we've got, we've got the kind of conversion figures, so you can you know, read one machine off against, or one, one meter off against the others, and what you'd expect to see uh, lineup level appear as, and where you'd expect to find those meters. And if you're in the business of, of starting to do QC, Although increasingly, because we're moving into a multi-channel environment with 5.1 and even 7.1 audio, um, you still see PPM meters an awful lot. Editors like them because it's an analog meter and it kind of mimics the way the human ear works. Um, but increasingly, 
uh, the QC um, operator has to be aware of, of, of more modern digital meters and how they relate to 5.1 surround sound audio. So there, there, if you remember back from our, our, our Tektronix um, uh, multi-screen display we saw earlier, that's, that's the, the little quarter tile there blown up and, and that's what the audio um, metering facility looks like. And uh, we've got, what we've got, we've got um, seven, no, we've got eight, nine bar graphs along the side there. Um, the first six of which show um, the 5.1 channel audio coming off a, uh, I think in this case, off a DVD. And then we've got uh, a made up stereo mix so that the operator knows what it will look like when, when a stereo playback of that material is, is performed. And then we've got uh, a loudness measurement meter next to um, the, 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 those bar graphs. And then finally, that rather interesting looking sort of squiggly line uh, displays, what's called a phase display. And that shows us how two of our channels relate to each other phase wise. And, and in the case of, of this recording, it's the left and the right, and that's marked on the, on the meter. Um, phase is a, is a, is a, a subject you know, all of its own and, and probably is beyond today's scope. But again, it's the kind of thing we go to into a, a lot of depth when we do our Audio 101 training. The bar graphs are akin to PPM meters in as much as the lower the level, the lower the bar, and the higher the level, the higher the bar. And there's a couple of significant levels marked on the bar graphs. Remember, these are, these are representing digital audio, so they tend to be labeled using the digital audio values of, of minus dBFS, decibels below digital maximum. And um, so, so again, running through those bars, we've got the left, the right, and the center channel, the LFE, the low frequency effects channel over the big bass bin that sits under your telly, and the two surround channels, the, the left surround and the right surround. And then, as I mentioned, uh, a, a made up stereo mix so we can see that it's working properly in stereo as well. And their loudness is something that um, is becoming very uh, important. A lot of broadcasters are, are starting to get quite hot on loudness measurement. Um, no doubt you've been in a situation where you've been watching the television, you get to an ad break, and the adverts seem louder. Uh, people complain about that. My mum complains about that all the time, that the advert breaks seem louder. Um, Technically speaking, they're not. Technically speaking, the people who made the adverts would have had to have submitted those to the QC department of the broadcaster in the same way, and their levels don't go above the same levels of the program. But the way they're mixed, with very little in the way of low end, very little quiet parts, makes them perceivably louder. But we'll get back onto loudness in a moment, because it's a measure, measuring uh, uh, task all of its own. Um, this is, this is getting back to video now, photosensitive epilepsy. Um, there was apparently in the mid-90s an episode of Pokemon, the, uh, the, the, the anime uh, kids show, uh, where because of flashing images, um, uh, a few Japanese children suffered photosensitive epilepsy, epilepsy seizures. Um, and really since the, the late 90s, Ofcom have been really, really hot on trying to avoid that ever happening on British television. And so there's a very well defined um, definition of what's allowed in terms of flashy images um, on the Ofcom uh, delivery specifications. You can get up from their website. And in fact, I've, I've, uh, I've cut and pasted a, a little portion of it there. And it's very well defined. It says that you know, you're not allowed more than a certain difference between two video frames, which would represent a flash, more than a certain number of times in a certain number of video frames. So it's a very well defined definition of what you're allowed. And, and the, the the material that typically violates this is, you know, paparazzi um, uh, cameras. So, so um, I was a technical supervisor on Big Brother for a few years, and, and the Friday night show where somebody would pull up in a limo and get out and all the cameras would go off was a nightmare for us because that always violated the PSE regulation. And, and for a live production, that's, that's, that's very hard. In fact, quite often on the news, the, 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 the newscaster will proceed a report by saying, you yeah, know, there's, there's, there's flashing photography from the outset. Um, and that's just because Ofcom are very hot on, on, on PSE see at the moment. There are several machines that can detect it and, uh, and increasingly um, you know, facilities are becoming aware of this and, 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 and they're applying those standards to their deliverables. Another, another issue um, which um, uh, you know, is, is the bane of, of, of facilities who do lots of um, 
adverts, uh, commercials work, and that's the BCAP regulations on caption sizes. So there's a little table there, which you, again, I'm, I do apologize, it's probably quite hard to read. Um, but that tells you how the preferred height and the minimum allowed height for captions on the end of a commercial. And invariably, you know, things of a legal matter, commercials producers will try and push them to the smallest size they can be, because they're negative and they detract from the, the positive message of the commercial. Um, but uh, the Ofcom code uh, 5.4.2 says they have to be, they must be legible, and, and they take a worse case, they must be legible on a small television. So that's another thing that, that a QC operator has to be aware of when they're QCing television material, and it's typically with commercials. Yet another thing, which is, again is, is, is content related, it's not, it's not the kind of thing that a, that a, that a, a digital machine could measure, is, is cages. Cages are um, electronically inserted markers on, on video signals that show where you're allowed to put captions, and, or, or rather where captions shouldn't stray out of and where graphics shouldn't stray out of. Um, historically, um, television manufacturers have always manufactured televisions so that they overscan the picture a little bit, so that the, the picture as delivered to the home, you don't quite see the whole picture, you see a, t a bit of a subset of the picture. And that's because in, in the days of analog television, you know, there'd often be noise or problems down the edges of the video signal, and television manufacturers thought it was better that they overscan the picture slightly, so you weren't aware of those faults. Um, consequently, broadcasters became very used to the fact that if they put captions right up to the edge of a picture, you might lose the first couple of letters. and. Uh, you know, in certain situations, uh, you know, name, name straps, supers at the bottom of the screen might, might produce hilarious results. And so consequently, um, now broadcasters are, are, are hot on, on, on where you can place captions. And that's governed by these markers, which um, here we've got, we've got them marked for 4x3 and 14x9 and 16x9. Of course, 14x9 and 4x3 are becoming less significant. As, um, as analog services are turned off, um, but still something that's specified by most broadcasters. Um, if, you, if you take the time to download these notes after, you'll be able to read all the, all the figures, how many lines, what percentage of the display is covered by, by um, the cages that you typically find in a, in a typical edit suite. Galloping along and, 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 um, and thinking about another aspect of, of, of television test and measurement, physical transport problems. Even in our digital age, where every video signal is a digital data stream, um, the engineer or the operator still has to be aware of, of degradation to the signal and how that will affect uh, recordings uh, and such like. Um, if, if your signal is only on the edge of working and you're doing a layback and you start dropping frames, you may not notice it uh, as the layback's being done. The editor may not know that there's corrupt frames gone onto the videotape or, or onto the encoder for the digital assets. Um, and Television test sets are, are able to check on the physical quality of the signal that's being delivered to the machine room, to the, the VTR that's recording the program, or to the encoder that's getting it ready for transmission. And, and so things like um, the, the eye height pattern and, and other things are available on, on a modern test set to, to show how, you know, how the signal's bearing up under the strain. Um, other things that, 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 that need to be paid attention to, time code, is the quality of the time code signal correct? And, and does the start of each frame of time code match the start of each frame of pictures on tape? Um, AES, the, the digital audio standard that we, we use at the moment, um, is that correctly contained within the serial digital data stream? And is it correctly timed with a video? It might have sounded great leaving the edit suite, but if, if a non-synchronous recording has been made onto the videotape or been encoded for transmission, uh, you might find that every few seconds you've got digital splats, clicks and splats, and, and nobody wants that. So just really getting back to that, what, what we mentioned earlier about um, uh, perceived loudness and, uh, uh, and more advanced audio parameters, um, Nowadays, it would be unusual that a program just has a stereo mix and off it goes. Nowadays, most things have to think about a 5-1 uh, mix to go to the broadcaster, particularly if they're in HD. If they've been commissioned in HD, it's likely they'll have a, a multi-channel audio soundtrack to go with them. And Dolby E is the mechanism by which um, uh, multi-channel audio is typically delivered. So rather than occupying six channels on the VTR, Dolby E allows those six channels to be encoded into the same data space that only two channels would take. 
Now, in addition to um, being able to encode many channels onto a VTR for delivery to the broadcaster, um, there's also some other um, aspects of, of multi-channel audio that, that need to be considered. Um, if you've got a modern test set, then, then typically these can be measured automatically. But as we, we touched on earlier, uh, audio loudness is very significant at the moment. Um, and, and without something that can, can do it for you, it's very hard to measure. You can't measure audio loudness, perceived loudness, off a PPM meter. Uh, and so the, 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 the tile you can see there um, is, again, taken off a Tektronix test set. And that shows us our overall program levels with, with the sort of perceived loudness marked in by color. And we've got a couple of, of sort of running totals down the bottom there. You can see the NEG 25 and then two smaller ones below that. Um, and that tells us like an instantaneous loudness measurement and then two other loudness measurements, one relating to the last few seconds of the program and one relating to several minutes of the program. Uh, again, it's, uh, th those three figures are defined by broadcasters and they, and they want programs to conform to that so that there's no overall you know, increase of perceived loudness or d you know, across the length of a program. There's a couple of other um, parameters that get encoded in the Dolby E uh, data stream that even allow your uh, AV receiver at home to do a better job of producing uh, a correctly delivered audio signal. And, and they're called dial dialogue normalization and dynamic range. Um, again, it's, it's probably a bit beyond the scope of today, but uh, uh, if, if you have a modern television or a modern AV receiver at home, uh, those two things allow your, your AV receiver at home to make a better job of providing you with a mix that sounds good in your environment. So leaving audio and video and those physical layer things behind, just really a little look at some of the other problems that uh, are encountered with, with providing deliverables to a broadcaster. And that's the problem of bitrate reduction and codecs. So you can't fail to be aware of the fact that um, you know, all video, um, even the very uh, expensive drama productions, you know, the, the, the video will hit um, digital compression at points along its, its chain from when it's shot in the studio or on location, through its post-production process, through its preparation and, and delivery process to the broadcast, to, 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 the, to the end user at home. Um, so this, is, this, this might be a typical production workflow. So this is probably not very high uh, um, uh, uh, budget television because the, it's being shot on Z1 camcorders or maybe maybe a couple of years ago. It's an HD, um, a budget HD production, shall we say. So it's being shot at 18 megabits using the MPEG-2 compression system. And then it might get back to base and be ingested into an Avid using a 145 megabit DNX uh, iframe compression. And then once the editor's you know, done his edit and, and, and everything else he wants to do to it, perhaps it's being laid back to HD Cam SR tape for delivery to Sky. That would be very typical. And, and that now it's being compressed to 440 megabits using MPEG-4, a long GOP um, studio profile. Uh, it arrives at the broadcaster who loads it into his transmission server and it's been crunched down to 20 megabits now using the H.264 codec. And then uh, when it's played out for delivery to home, it's going through a, 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 um, a coding and MUX process, which might use a statistical multiplexer, and, and all the way down to nine megabits. So one, two, three, four, five different compression systems. Um, and, and so you've got to say, well, it's actually amazing that the pictures look anything like what they should by the time they get to the, the viewer's television at home. And, and even if you could eliminate all those lower quality codecs and shoot on the very best quality videotape and post-produce it without any compression, there are still at least three encode, decode, codec changes between the cameraman and the viewer at home. So if you ever find yourself in a position where, where, where you're planning a production, paying attention to the number of codecs in the way, as it were, is very important. Um, uh, when um, uh, I worked on Fame Academy, which is a, 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 a talent show the BBC did about 10 years ago now, and uh, not only did we have that horrible sort of process of multiple codecs going through the system once, but because they wouldn't hire a return line from uh, Shepperton Studios, where the Friday Night Live show was done, to our OB in, uh, in, um, in Highgate in North London, we had to take an off-air recording for inclusion in the Friday Night Late Show. And, uh, and so it was that process, and then that process again, and, uh, and the pictures looked truly appalling by the time they were transmitted the second time round. So we've talked a lot about um, uh, you know, the process of QCing television today. And, and 
And really, by its very nature, that is a real video process. But increasingly, television isn't being made using videotapes and coaxial cables and all the paraphernalia that we've been used to over the last 50 years. Increasingly, television is being made in a file-based workflow. Um, it's not unusual now for camera crews to go out and shoot onto solid state media, you know, using maybe a Sony EX3 or, or something like that, uh, bringing it back to base. And of course, now it's a file. Why on earth would you want to turn it back into video to get it into your Avid or your Final Cut? You ingest the file straight across the computer network into the Avid or into the Final Cut. And when you're finished, well, if it's going to wind up on a transmission server to be played out to the people at home, why on earth would you want to lay it back to videotape? And so, Consequently, there are some productions now, and in fact, last summer we, we, we built a facility for a company that, that has an entirely file-based workflow, and they, they, they deliver all the way to Sky um, without the pictures and audio ever touching videotape, and so without them ever having the ability to feed the signal into a traditional television waveform monitor and look at the quality of it. And they, they needed a file-based QC approach. Now, there are several manufacturers who, who make software that can sit on your editing system shared storage, and they can squirrel into the files, they can check everything about them. In fact, the one we've been selling for a couple of years is Tektronix Serify, but there, there are others. Um, and that will um, sit on the same networks as your editing machine, as your playout server, as, as, as whatever equipment you have in your facility. And, and it will automatically go and inspect the files. It will check the file that it's a correctly formatted file. It will go and check that the codec contained within the file is correct. And it will even turn the data within the codec back into video internally within its processing and check for the levels, for the color gamut, as we saw earlier, for the audio levels, to make sure there's no loss of audio, that the description at the head of the file matches the number of channels of audio, and all those things. You know, more than 100 uh, uh, um, uh, characteristics typically uh, have to be checked. And, and so that really is the future of television QC. And um, you know, anybody who's building a modern facility will have to assume that, that you know, in, in short order, they'll be, they'll be getting uh, you know, a file-based QC system. So just a, as a bit of a recap, um, uh, you know, if you think about all those principles of audio and video measurement and, and why they're important, what that video signal looks like and, 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 and why um, it needs to be correct, why, you know, how legalizers fit into the whole process, color space and, and, and how to deal with restricted color spaces within HD programs, uh, audio, you know, different audio levels and, and how that relates to deliverables, and then all those other things which are picture-based like photosensitive epilepsy, you know, flashing images, um, BCAP caption sizes and all the other things uh, uh, that, that relate to the, the, the real legality of the program, not just the technical legality of the program. Now, um, as I say, this is, this is really by its nature just a, just a taster, uh, a training taster for the, the service, uh, for, for the courses that we run at our offices or indeed at your premises if you have enough people who need to be trained. There are some of the other um, uh, courses that we offer, TCPIP for broadcast engineers. Um, engineers have to be aware of computer networks nowadays. Every, every machine uh, that gets installed in a television facility is, is either running the Mac OS, Linux or Windows. And so networking is very important for broadcast engineers engineers. Um, Audio 101, Video 101 and, and Television QC 101, which is what we've touched on today. And we have some other things coming along as well, uh, relating to uh, digital media files and uh, television infrastructure, health and safety for television and colorimetry for television. All um, courses that we're about ready to launch, which, you know, you know, if people have a need for, we can deliver. Um, as I say, the, uh, the URL for, for these notes, if you want to download them yourself, is uh, route6.com slash blog. That's uh, the company's technical blog, and you'll find a load of good information there uh, relating to uh, um, editing systems and the like. And, uh, and really, that, that finishes me off for the day. So uh, if there's any questions, I'll uh, happily take those now.